Hi, thanks for coming to the marsh tonight. Of course, the marsh now is my living room and uh, the houses of performers who you're going to see here tonight. Um, a very strange set of events uh, that I guess we're probably going to have to live with for the next couple of seasons of the coming year. Um, but um, I've been really enjoying working with people uh, in this new environment and um, people have really been enjoying being able to develop new work, be able to tell some of their stories and be able to um, spend this time in a way that is, is creative. Um, and people have some really interesting stories to tell. Uh, so we've got four performers tonight uh, doing all new material uh, of, and it's all very varied. So um, without any further ado, just want to acknowledge the this miracle that is creating new work, work that did not exist a few months ago. And uh, then I want to introduce our first performer tonight, Pearl Ong. I'm sitting in the lobby of the Pac Bell building in San Ramon. It's 8 a.m. I feel like throwing up. My anxiety <laughs> is off the chart. It took an hour, an hour to go from San Francisco. So I've been up since 6 a.m. This is the first day of my first job after graduating from college at the age of 31. My boss gets here. I stand up, force a smile to tamp back the panic. Jim McCabe is a big guy, six foot four, broad shouldered. He's an overweight, red faced southerner in his 60s. He wears his platinum blonde hair in a side part. He's wearing a suit and tie, a white shirt with a pocket protector. My first exposure to an American Southerner was Foghorn Leghorn, the bossy rooster <laughs> in Looney Tunes, which I looked forward to every Saturday morning as a kid in Hong Kong. McCabe, like Foghorn, is oversized. He liked to harass a juvenile chicken hawk all the time. Looky here, son. I say, son, did you see that hawk bother them hens? He scared them. That Rhode Island red turned white, then blue. Rhode Island, red, white, blue. It's a joke, son, a flag waver. You're built too low. Fast ones go over your head. <laughs> Hello. So nice to see you again. We're so pleased to have you here. How was the drive? Was there much traffic? Uh, slowed up a bit at the Caldecott, but all in all pretty smooth. I left off the part where I was going 80 miles an hour down 680 because I was running late. I'm wearing a light wool suit. It's quite a sharp navy blue number with shoulder pads. I have on a white shirt buttoned up all the way to the top. The jacket drapes loosely and the skirt is long with slits on the side. I have on white tights, black piacadan flats and lipstick. I follow McCabe across the lobby and almost trip because I'm taking such long strides. The skirt is narrow. If I keep this up, I'm going to split the seams and turn into a cocktail waitress before lunch. Yes. <laughs> we take the elevator upstairs and meet the rest of the group. All the guys are wearing ties and one guy is wearing a three-piece suit. Oh my God. I'm right over here. And your cube is down here over, the, over here. Uh, there's a supply closet around the corner. Just get what you need. Uh, fill out these forms, get settled. And Aaron will take you out to lunch. 
My cube is pretty big. It's kind of private. Partition's about five feet tall. The desk is huge. And the chair is comfy. It swivels. It goes, <laughs> it goes up and it goes down. <laughs> Swivel and roll all over the chair. I like it. <laughs> there are bookshelves and drawers, lots and lots of drawers and a file drawer. There's a slim one for pens and things. I should put something in them. I mix my way to the supply closet. Mm -mm -mm. I open the double doors. Oh my God. There's all manner of yellow pads, spiral notebooks, bound notebooks, automatic pencils, pens, file folders, post-it notes in three different sizes, staplers, roller balls, red, black, <laughs> and blue. I grab a box for home, but then I put it back. Best not to start stealing on the first day. <laughs> I log in, get settled. Finally, it's time for lunch. Aaron comes to get me. We're going to Applebee's. I love this place and Pac Bell is pain. Really? I've never heard of it. Sounds great. In my mind, I'm picturing Zuni with its waitstaff dress Parisian style with yeah. a tie, a shirt, a vest, and a apron wrapped around their waist. My friend and I would go sit in the bar and we'd split a Caesar salad and a burger and have enough money for one drink each. I'd always get the screwdriver because they made it with fresh squeezed orange juice. <laughs> Today, I can get anything I want. Maybe they'll have oysters. We drive to a mall. Oh, yeah, this is the suburbs. Where's the restaurant? Aaron starts walking towards this place with a big green sign. And is that an apple on top? She opens the door with a wide grin. I walk in. What the heck? This is a regular sandwich place. Where does she normally eat? After lunch, I meet with McCain. Did you go to Applebee's for lunch? <laughs> the sandwiches there are really good, aren't they? I just want to go over briefly what we do here in this group. We support the repair centers. Each repair center gets a printout every day of all the trouble tickets. This data stream is also redirected into our NSDM system and we take this data and we collect it into reports that make it easier for them to assign the tickets and keep track of the repair orders. It's in C, it's written in C on a Unix system. You're enrolled in a few courses on the Unix operating system starting next week. In the meantime, here's some reading you can do. Any questions? He's writing in small, very neat letters on a notepad. It's got my name on it, the date, and notes. He's taking notes. He's keeping a file on me. Oh, we're to have regular meetings? One-on-ones, as he calls them? Did he write down what he just told me? Because I've already forgotten. All of it. I don't even remember enough to ask a question. Maybe I should cut back on the pot. Just two weeks ago, I was a cab driver. In my seven plus years at the Soto Cab, I only met with the boss twice. First when he hired me, and a second time when there was a complaint from a regular who knew him on a first name basis. George Penn, the general manager, was very well liked. He always wore a suit and tie. He was in his 60s. He treated everybody with respect. And he used to be a driver, just like us. 
Ah, Miss Song, have a seat. Mr. O'Malley called. He said he was in your cab the other day. Doesn't ring a bell. An elderly gentleman? He said you threw him out of your cab? Oh, yeah, well, he kept calling me a chink. I don't have to take that. I see. He said you put him out on the freeway? Yeah. <laughs> well, 480. 480 is barely a freeway. It's only got three exits. And it wasn't busy. If, if it was busy, I wouldn't have done it. Anyway, I put him right by the Washington Street off ramp. Uh huh. Ms. Song, here at DeSoto, we don't dump people on the freeway under any circumstance. It's especially worrying because he's old. I'm so sorry. You're right. I wasn't thinking. Please don't do that again. No, absolutely not. Sorry about that. From cab driver to software engineer, how did I get here? I've been driving cab for three and a half years when I felt I was done with the hard partying that had come, that had become a way of life. I needed something else to do. I went to registration at San Francisco State looking for classes that met at 1 or 2 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Intro to computing caught my eye. Sounds like something everyone should know, whatever. I'm hungover and hungry. And when the alarm rang at 10 this morning, I threw it against the wall. I get on a long, slow line. And finally, it's my turn. The lady writes my name down. And then she says, you're 45th on the waiting list. What? Jesus Christ, forget it. Oh, no, no, no. You get in. They drop like flies. Intro to computing did its job and sucked up 25 hours a week, leaving much less time for hanging out, partying, and snorting cocaine. <laughs> I got an A. I signed up for the next class in the, in the progression. I got a B plus in that. Could this turn into an actual career? The third class in the progression was on algorithms. I would start studying when I got home from work around 2.30 or 3 in the morning while sipping Scott to unwind. That's after starting to smoke pot around 11 p.m. to insulate myself from my passengers. There was a lot of reading and it was very, very dense. Sometimes when I turned the page, my mind went blank. And then I had to start over. And then the previous page looked like gibberish. I tried to flip the page faster. <laughs> the class meets at 1 p.m. I've just rolled out of bed. I'm gonna go to work right afterward. I'm starving. I pick up lunch on the way, sit in the back of a darkened lecture hall, and open my bag. I take my burrito out, carefully unwrap the tinfoil, and take a big bite. The people in front of me turn around and shoot me a look. I wrapped it back up. I can eat the rest later. I put it back in the bag. A tortilla chip falls out and crunches underfoot. One of them turns around again. She's got long dark hair and big brown eyes. She looks Eurasian. <coughs> when the class empties out, they're ahead of me. There's one guy and two women. They're speaking French. The Eurasian is wearing capris, flats, a white t-shirt with buttons, a Cartier watch on her wrist, an oversized colorful leather jacket on her shoulder and a book bag slung over her shoulder. The look is hip European. She is tall, 
slim and beautiful. As it happens, they're also headed for the food court. I catch up. Hi, I'm in your class back there. Uh-huh. That bit on recursion was cool, huh? Yeah, it's okay. My name is Pearl. What's yours? Camille? Oh, hi, Camille. Nice to meet you. It's Camille? Oh, right. I'm in need of some coffee after that, huh? Maybe it was that giant burrito you ate? <laughs> I didn't eat it all. Save some for later. They got their coffee and sat down at a table. I got my coffee and casually saunter over. Weather's nice, huh? Hey, I really love your leather jacket. Where'd you get it? Oh, it's my brother's. He got it in Paris. Oh, I was thinking I hadn't seen anything like it before. You go to Paris often? Uh, no, maybe once a year. Oh. <laughs> the other woman pipes up. Hi, I'm Juliette. Would you like to sit with us? Yeah, yeah, just for a bit, and then I have to go to work. You're working now? What do you do? Oh, I'm a cab driver. I drive with the Soto cab. Oh, you work at night? Aren't you nervous? Oh, no, I've been doing it for a while. Camille looks at me. That's interesting. <laughs> How do you work? Oh, you know, bar closing, 233. I help out at Cafe Floor sometimes. If you're in the neighborhood, drop by and see if I'm there. Of course, I'm there the very next day. We have a chat over coffee. Her father is Chinese from Singapore. Her mother is French. They live in Paris and New York. She is effortlessly cool yet warm and open. Her father sends her a ticket to Paris on the Concorde. She cashes it in and buys a 1966 Mustang convertible. Mm. I guess you'll just fly regular business class. A bunch of us, me and a bunch of her friends, tool around all summer with the top down. She is popular. And it seems as always forgetting that she has a date with some guy or another and then improvises by throwing him in the car with the rest of us. As with all attractive people, I imagine she is aware that I like her too. One day she says, Juliette and I are going to go to the Kabuki for a concert tonight and we have an extra ticket. Why don't you come? Who's the band and how much is the ticket? Don't worry about the ticket, just come. I've never heard of the band before. When we get to the Kabuki, she offers me a quaalude. And because I'm a smitten lemming, I take it. <laughs> I'm drinking scotch, she's drinking vodka. We stand in the back, my back is against the wall so I don't get, fall over. It's one of the best concerts I've ever been to. A year later, only Juliette remembers the name of the band. <sighs> you guys don't remember? It was the cure. It's the focus. <laughs> Camille and I study for a midterm at her place. During our break, she puts on she puts on Grace Jones's dancing, walking in the rain. We start dancing. At some point, our eyes meet and I touch her hand ever so lightly. We move closer and we start kissing. The next day, we arrive in class together with wet hair. Her friends look at her and then at me and we both look straight ahead. After my first day at Pac Bell, I meet up with Camille for a drink at Cafe Floor. So, how was it? Oh my God. I couldn't wait to go home fast five minutes after I got there. This is gonna be painful. 
So what did you wear? Oh, you know, blue suit I wore to your wedding. Oh, that was a disaster. You looked like you were going to a job interview. Did you carry a purse or did you just shove your keys in your wallet and your skirt? That was a disaster too. Stop complaining. No, I brought a leather briefcase from my father. It looks like a big envelope. I put my wallet and my keys in there. So, how are the people? How's your boss? I don't know, man. He's an old southerner. This is going to be hard. Oh, come on. You only have to do this for a year. A whole year of driving to San Ramon and working with a bunch of straight-laced suburbanites? That could kill me, or at least drive me to drink. So, nothing new. Hey. Let me just refresh my lipstick. I can't cut hair without red lipstick. It's like spinach for Popeye. This was the half serious joke I would tell my clients. It's a simple concept. It's my job to help shift the perception people have of themselves when they look in the mirror so that when they look in the mirror, they feel more beautiful. When I catch a glimpse of me in the mirror while I'm working with my hair styled and my makeup done, wearing fashionable clothes, my creative juices flow. The mirror feedback to my brain tells me, confirms indeed, that I am a makeup and hairstylist who creates living art on people because I look like one. That's all changed. N95 mask. Yeah. My fashion statement now, quack, quack. <laughs> Protective face shield, nitrile glove, medical scrub that I shed in the garage before I enter the house to greet my husband. Plexiglass between hair stations. All surfaces must be sanitized before and after each client. Disinfect pump chair. Shampoo bowl, faucets, doorknobs, and hair between, and, and light switches. Mandatory temperature taking. And keeping records for contact tracing. Mandatory health questions. And a signed COVID waiver in order to confirm every appointment. Do you or anyone in your bubble have any symptoms of the virus? Outside on the deck in back of our salon, my colleague Jennifer and I get together to do a role play rehearsal, preparing for the salon to reopen. Plus, we need haircuts too. So Jennifer is wearing just a mask because she's pretending to be the client. And of course, this is me. Kathleen, oh God, I chopped away at my hair. I lost my head. You've got to fix it for me. Okay, come on, sit down. Let me take a look. Oh, I see. Wow. This is so weird doing this with all this protective equipment. I don't recognize myself. Jesus. Damn, I keep cutting the gloves. Jennifer, I can't do this with gloves. I'm going to have to just disinfect my hands before and after I touch you. As soon as I put my hands on Jennifer's head, I am surprised how quickly I drop into my zone. God, I miss cutting hair. And I'm really enjoying it. The feel and the process, but then, damn, my face shield keeps fogging up. And I can't see what I'm doing. Oh, 
Forgive me, all you real medical people out there, all the doctors, the nurses, and, and medical technicians helping to save people's lives who have to wear all this PPE even in normal times. I know, I'm no hero. I, I'm just cutting hair. <laughs> mask and a face shield. It's my first day and I am about to receive my first client after six months. Jason is a lean concert pianist in his 60s, 5'5", five five, small build. He has an angular jaw, dark wavy hair and wears tortoise, round tortoise glasses, tortoise shell glasses. He's waiting outside for my text signal. Jason, come to the front door and use the hand sanitizer bolted to the wall there. When I let you in, I will take your temperature with the temperature gun. Send. But then I see him walking up to the front door with his usual thermos of tea and I, I bang on the window. Jason, no, I'm so sorry, but no beverage is allowed. We both have to keep our masks on at all times. You can just leave it outside. Well, hello, long time no see. Welcome. <laughs> Don't shove that thing in my face. But, but I have to take your, I'm supposed to take your temperature. Well, <laughs> You could have at least warned me. Well, I, I did tell you in the text. Well, you should have at least said something before shoving that thing in my face. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm already having a bad day. I'm you. <laughs> to hear that. You're absolutely right. I, I should have, I, I should have said, pardon me, Jason, but um, I need to take your temperature with this thermometer gun. I, I guess I'm a little nervous getting used to these protocols. Please forgive me. 
Do you still want a haircut? Well, yes, of course. Okay, well then we can head out to the back onto the deck. I'm all set up out there. Well, don't I get a robe? I'm sorry, no robes. Um, but I will be putting a cape around your neck and I'll be cutting your hair dry. Well, aren't you gonna shampoo my hair? I mean, that's the best part. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. According to the Alameda County Health Department and uh, State Board, no services indoors yet. No shampoo bowl, no color services, no blow dries. Well, that really sucks. <laughs> Listen, Jason, I don't make the rules. I'm just trying to keep you and me safe by following them. I, I did mention all of this in my confirmation email. Well, are you gonna be charging me the same amount? Actually, um, I've had to raise my prices uh, because of the extra costs and um, the risk factor. I mentioned all of these details also in my confirmation email. Shall we? I dragged my pump chair outside and set up everything under the picnic umbrella. Meticulously sanitized, haircutting scissors, clips, and combs placed neatly on a clean towel on a freshly disinfected black metal cafe table. The mirrored sliding glass doors of the adjacent suite serve as a convenient mirror for my garden station. And in the weeks before we got the green light to reopen, I had planted a tiny garden in the two rectangular wooden garden boxes. Small green fava bean plants, now a foot tall, wave gently in the breeze. No beans yet, but the potted cherry tomato plant boasts three little green fruits. There's a green leafy hedge with cascading purple wisteria creeping over the wooden fence between our deck and the property next door. A sweet little garden escape in anticipation of working outside on the deck. Deck seemed like a good idea. And right now, we both could use a little calming. I draped the cape around Jason's neck. Um, could you make that tighter? I don't want to get any hair down my back. Oh, sure. For a nanosecond, a picture flashes through my mind of tightening the cape till his face turns a nice shade of blue. <laughs> oh. How's that? Great. Oh, good. Try to create an atmosphere of love and nurturing for clients. I want the salon to be like a filling station for the soul. As a service provider, my focus is on the client. And as a professional, I pack up my needs neatly in a little box before I receive my clients. Isn't that the essence of good service? To listen as people vent, to be the strong yet Gentle presence as people bear their souls in my chair, crying. To pamper, massage, and tend to every beauty need when people feel depleted. Providing respite from the grind of their lives. And ultimately, to feel transformed when they gaze into the mirror at the polished, renewed version of themselves that I've helped them achieve. It's been six months since his last haircut with me. I survey his self-styled mullet, assessing the damage. But, so uh, it was sticking out at the side, so I, I, I chopped away at it a little bit. No problem, I'll, I'll just shape it and crop it close like you like it.
As soon as I start cutting Jason's hair, there is silence. And Jason, it's a warm summer day in August. The sun is shining and the birds are singing in the tall pine tree next door. As I'm cutting, Jason, <laughs> I work with the moving target. And when I'm finished, here you go, Jason. What do you think? Oh, 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 wow. That looks, that looks great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I was so cranky before. That's okay, we're all adjusting to a new normal. My mom used to cook fresh fava beans in a rich tomato, basil, and garlic sauce and serve them over pasta shells. A little grated Pecorino Romano cheese, Italian comfort food. I'm in the garden in back of our home. I never felt like I had enough time for gardening until now. My husband is a master gardener. Planting fava beans puts nitrogen back into the soil. The two foot tall stalks seem to sprout up overnight like Brussels sprout poles with black and white flowers in between clumps of pointy green leaves. He planted them in the huge clay pots and in the flower beds along the side of the house. But before the plants even started producing bumpy pods of beans, he mentioned something about cutting them down. Something about all the nitrogen going into the beans instead of back into the soil. Oh no, Dan, don't cut them down. I love fava beans. And it's so cool. We can grow food in our backyard, especially now in the middle of a pandemic. During the early days of the shelter in place, the whole world came to a standstill. Photos of elephants marching out of the forests in Thailand, curiously parading down city streets. And like wild Kashmiri goats with that long shaggy white hair with those circular horns, frolicking in the streets of Wales. And in Africa, a pride of lions napping together in the middle of the road instead of hiding themselves in the long, tall grasses of the bush. The animal kingdom seemed puzzled. All the people just disappeared. And in India, blue skies for the first time in years in New Delhi, notorious for thick gray air pollution. Without us to muck things up, nature seems to be automatically restoring balance and beauty. The earth miraculously healing herself. My life has been a nonstop. My life had been nonstop going and doing for so long that I didn't even realize how far out of nature's rhythm I had fallen. Okay, 2020 has been so tumultuous for so many people, all of us. It's been so hard. And in the midst of so much suffering and loss, I know that I am very blessed. Now my days start on Zoom with yoga, with an intimate community, tuning in from several, several countries. I actually spend time singing and writing songs and and now I garden. It took a pandemic to actually for me to actually appreciate putting my hands in the soil and what that could offer. My first hair color client inside the salon, 
after six months. We're both wearing masks and of course, me a face shield. Kathleen, I am so happy to see you. I have missed you so much. Sherry, I am so happy to see you too. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take my gray roots and I tried to color my hair and I think I, I messed it all up. Oops, section of Sherry's hair. Looks like uh, a shish kebab hair crime. Starting from the scalp, two inches of glaring gray roots, three inches of wimpy half colored henna hair, and then the last three inches dark permanent dye. For the shelter in place, Sherry had a big silver streak in the front of her face, in the front of her hair, and, and a peekaboo silver streak on the other side that I had carefully cultivated over the course of many months, growing it out, protecting it with conditioner when I applied deep, rich brown color to the rest of her hair. Her silver streaks used to glisten and shine with razor sharp contrast to the adjacent dark hair. Okay, I know it sounds a little bit like Cruella DeVille's hairstyle, but it was really dramatic and it seemed to be a really big hit with the guys that she was meeting on Match.com. Those once crisp silver streaks are now muddy, tainted, violated. Okay, okay, breathe, girl. I cannot freak her out. I cannot freak her out. Kathleen, I know how hard you worked on my silver streaks, but I was thinking maybe we could put a few dark streaks in to soften the contrast a little. Oh, a few dark streaks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe Maybe uh, we could go in a natural direction with more of my gray hair showing. Hmm. More gray hair showing. Okay. Oh, what a comfort it is to be in your chair again. You are so the best. And I know if anyone can fix this, you can. Oh, that is so sweet of you to say. How am I gonna fix this mess? This needs massive color correction. I don't know, it could take maybe three or four hours. I don't know for sure. There could be surprises in the process along the way. Kathleen, I have a dinner date in two and a half hours. Do you think we'll be okay? Two and a half hours, hmm. Okay, uh, I'll need to focus. And anyway, due to COVID protocol, we should probably stop talking now. For the first 15 minutes, I'm trying to come up with a game plan. There are so many things going on on her head. It's like a three ring circus. Her sections of dark hair are like the chocolate brown ponies and her silver streaks are the striped tigers and her gray roots are the gray elephants who need to become chocolate brown, like the ponies. How will I ever make this look normal? Use demi-permanent hair color and use bleach too. And don't get dark color on the already darkened ends. Hair color angels? Right, I get it, I get it. I spring into action like a whirling dervish, mixing color in one bowl and bleach in another. In a trance like Mother Kali with six arms, I start slapping bleach on erroneously darkened ends and wrapping the hair up in tinfoil like little hair burritos. I paint a nice, rich chestnut brown hair color onto the faded midsection of her hair. 
The scalp heat will process fast, but, co but color on the gray roots last. Gray elephant roots need to move slowly to catch up with the little brown ponies. Right, I get it, I get it, I get it. The timing is a delicate balancing act. All the different parts must complete processing close to around the same time. I keep checking her and finally she's cooked. At the shampoo ball, first I wash off the brown, dark brown color, which looks uniform from roots to ends. Yes! Then I start to unroll the little hair burritos. But when the water hitch hits the hair with the bleach, it turns a bright canary yellow and orange. Shit. I've got 30 minutes to fix this, blow dry her thick head of hair and get her out for her to meet her date. Relax, relax. She just needs a toner. Of course. I'll be right back. I mix up a violet ash remedy, run back and massage it into the rebellious bleached bits. Oh, please, oh, please turn the right color of silver. <sighs> yes, I know, be patient, right? Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. The yellow orange canaries start turning into soft silver gray doves. Yes. I have 20 whole minutes to blow dry Sherry's hair before she must leave. When I finish drying it, I apply a product that makes it glisten and shine like diamonds. Oh, oh my God. I love it. You're amazing. You are a hair alchemist. Thank you, hair color angels. <clears throat> the sun is shining in the garden at home. And, and there are now plump pregnant pods on our fava bean planks. Wearing my straw hat and gardening gloves, I grab the clippers that my husband gifted me with the orange rubber handles and start clipping away. And as I fill my stainless steel bowl with my beautiful beans, I feel something inside of me filling up. Tonight, we're having fresh fava beans cooked in a rich tomato sauce with garlic and basil. Fava beans from our garden. And I'll serve them over pasta shells with some Romano cheese. Comfort food, comfort that I am extremely grateful to have and privileged to have. So simple, so beautiful, and yet kind of a miracle. Thank you. Yay. After our Saturday morning chores are done, Amy, Pam, Chris, and I go to our big side yard situated next to our old Victorian style home. Our property, including our house on Yahomi Street, lies on half an acre. Our yard is a mini orchard of fruit and nut trees, three rows with five trees in each row. There are apples, oranges, lemons, cherries, peaches, pears, plums, almonds, and walnuts. 
You enter our little orchard from the front yard through a tall rickety wooden gate. A huge persimmon tree is the first tree you see with its broad foliage of large green leaves. It looms larger and more majestic than the other smaller orderly trees that sit so neatly in rows. Each year, this strong, sturdy tree never fails to produce an overabundance of bright orange, small, pumpkin-shaped fruit with the dark leaves attached. Unfortunately, no one in the family cares for persimmons, not one of us. Mom tried so many persimmon recipes, persimmon cookies, persimmon pies, persimmon, persimmon pudding, <laughs> but with no success. No one in our family likes this particular fruit. On occasions, we would get inquiries about our tree. Amy, get the door, honey. Someone's knocking. Mom could always hear above the general noise inside the house. Hello? Amy is looking at a couple of strangers standing outside the screen door. Hi, we were passing by and noticed that beautiful persimmon tree in your backyard. Uh-huh. This is an odd request, but would it be at all possible for us to pick some of the fruit off your tree? You have so many and our family just loves persimmons. Instantly from inside the house came a barrage of responses from family members within earshot of the conversation. Oh, please do take as much as you want. Yes, thanks so much for taking them. The strangers at the door were slightly surprised to hear so many voices that rang out quite suddenly, but they were also very pleased at the enthusiastic affirmative responses. Amy checks with mom who says, of course. Well, we just can't thank you enough. We will definitely make use of them. They excitedly make their way to the big tree outside. Inside the house, we are celebrating. It is a win-win situation for everyone. Hugging the side of the house are rose bushes and other bright flowers my dad nurtures and grows. These stretch across the back of the property and extend down the other side of the yard. This creates a wide colorful frame around the orchard. Dad always makes up a special bouquet of roses for mom and puts them in a vase for her to enjoy. She gently feels the soft red, yellow, or pink petals, but most of all, she loves their fragrance. You see, my mom is blind and has been blind since she was 15 months old. She was on an immigrant boat with the rest of her family in 1918 on their way to Hawaii for the men to work in the sugarcane fields. The Spanish flu spread through the ship and my mom was the only child under five years old who did not die as a result of the pandemic, but it had dire consequences she became totally blind as a toddler. My hardworking, soft-spoken father, also a Filipino immigrant, finds this orchard to be his cherished haven. For a time, he is whisked away from the responsibility of providing for such a large family, the dependence of his wife to be her eyes and transportation, and the busy, often chaotic household with six kids. The vast expanse of green lawn is like a rich carpet underneath the healthy trees. This is where he finds his self gratification and the highest rewards. Keeping these beautiful trees productive and healthy is his mission. We are a family of six girls and we romp and delight in our own personal garden of Eden. Anytime we're hungry and playing outside, we only have to run to the peach or apple tree and indulge in an instant snack. On school days, after a long walk home with the warm Napa sun blaring down, we run to our lovely yard, fling our school bags onto the grass, and one at a time, run up the tall ladder to gather a handful or two of the rich red cherries from the cherry tree. The sister at the top of the ladder, picking her cherries, can always look down and see an eager sister looking up, waiting at the bottom for her turn to climb up. Fruit tastes amazing right off the tree, which is why we individually wanted to pick our own cherries. Though we do not help dad with the watering or maintaining the fruit from the trees, we are often expected to help with the harvesting. 
Mom directs us in this task. She calls the sisters together and we go outside to retrieve the apples that have fallen on the ground or to pluck the ripened peaches or lemons off the heavy fruit laden trees before they become inedible. An especially arduous task for me is picking up the countless walnuts or almonds that have fallen on the ground. Each individual nut has a leathery hull that protects the actual nut. Our hands get black from removing the partially split hulls from the unripe nuts. Picking them up one by one and removing the hard hull was difficult for me. And there are so many to pick up. This is one of those times I am glad there are six kids in our family. My mom leads by example and kneels on the ground, feeling around for the nuts and gathering them up. She firmly requests we do the same when she senses a stop in our activity. We haul the pans of nuts we collect up the stairs and into the kitchen. We, my mom included, crawl out the back window of our kitchen onto the low roof that covers the walkway that, that, that covers the walkway below that leads to the back door of the first floor. This is an ideal space for laying the nuts out for the sun to dry. Then we all crawl back to the window and back into the kitchen and scrub really hard to get the black gunky stuff out of our hands and fingers. Eventually the heat of the sun dries out the nuts and they are ready to be eaten. But not until we, including my mom, again crawl out the window to check them first and be sure they are ripe. To me, it seems like a lot of work for the number of nuts that we get, but it was something that needed to be done. To have all that healthy organic fruit and nuts at our disposal was something I never appreciated until I left home for college. I also never realized the rich labor of love that my dad gave to keep those trees so productive and healthy and to grow beautiful roses for my mom to smell. But in our family, nothing is wasted. Mom and the three older daughters, Diana, Minerva, and Amy, are in the kitchen canning the fruit that I sometimes begrudgingly picked. I know this will be nearly an all-day event. I come to watch out of curiosity, but I'm not old enough to help. My mom gives directions and shows the girls what to do. The big kitchen table where our family of eight have our meals is now covered with so many mason jars. Their lids, paraffin wax, remnants of fruit peelings, discarded apple seeds and peach pits, fruit still to prepare, and hot water boiling on the stove. There are interesting smells wafting from the kitchen. I am most interested watching the mel melting of the hard paraffin squares and see the hot wax being poured into the jar on top of the cut fruit floating in the watery liquid. I am fascinated watching the softened wax harden to make a seal for the jar that we would open later in the year. I'm a little worried though, as I watch my mom pour the melted paraffin into the jar and gingerly and oh so slightly touch the hot melted wax and the rim of the jar with her fingers to be sure she doesn't overspill. She seems to get it right every time. The mason jars with the colorful fruit are stored in a small walk-in pantry off the big kitchen. Later, it will become a tiny but cozy bedroom for one of the more sensitive sisters who need a lone retreat from the busy and noisy household. Our kitchen is situated in the very back of the house and is the site of many special activities for the Alato girls and especially the four kids. That's the moniker we give ourselves to describe the last four sisters out of the six in our family. That would be Amy, Pam, Priscilla, and me, Martha. We even created our own logo using the number four and a capital K. Diana and Minerva, the other two sisters, are older and have vastly different interests than the four kids. Mom is mixing up the ingredients for a cake and the four kids are watching her with anticipation. Okay, girls, now I am putting in these small items in the batter. Remember, if you get one of them in your portion of the cake, that determines what will happen to you in your future. We watch her drop the four small objects in the cake batter in the mixing bowl. As she pours it into the pan, we try to get a glimpse of the batter, but couldn't spot any of the things she had just put in. We could hardly wait for the cake to be baked and cooled. 
After cutting an equal portion of the cake for each of us, Amy was quickly curious. Okay, Pam, what did you get? Wait, let me get it out of my mouth. Some of us weren't really eating the cake. We were just gouging it with our forks to see what we got, or even if we got anything. Oh, I got the penny. That means I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be rich, see, Pris? Darn, I wanted that. That's not fair. I never get the penny. I got the dumb thimble. She started to cry. I don't want to grow up to be an old maid. As we comforted our youngest sister for her future as an old maid, Amy bragged. Well, look what I got, the ring. Guess I'm going to get married. Sorry, Pris, honey. I looked at the button that was buried but visible in the piece of cake on my plate. Pam noticed also. Oh, March, you got the button, so you're going to be a housewife. I shrugged my shoulders. Oh, well, that's okay. I was a little disappointed that I didn't get the ring or the penny. That would have been nice. But I also knew that it was just a game. At least I wasn't going to be an old maid like Pris. We girls also like to bake cakes, and we always make them from scratch. Hey, Pam, do you want to make a cake with me? It's so much more fun doing it with someone than all by myself. Well, I had planned to read a little, but okay, I'll make it with you. I agree, it's an awful lot of work for one person. Maybe we should ask Pris. Pam is always the thoughtful sister. Pris would not want to be left out. Sure, why not? She can help us get the things we need. I'm also thinking, yes, and there's more help when we have to clean up. So we spread out throughout the kitchen, retrieving everything we need, big cake pan, mixing bowl, measuring cups and spoons, then the can of Crisco, flour, baking powder, sugar, mm. salt, eggs, milk, vanilla extract. We laugh and have small conversations as we measure each item and put everything in the mixing bowl in order. We mix it, pour the batter into the cake pan, and finally it's in the oven. Whew. This takes so much time. But then after all that, we have to put everything back in its place in the cupboards and clean the mess of powders, spilled liquids, and dripped cake batter. It is a lengthy process. But the smell and the sight of a newly baked cake that we just made makes us feel quite accomplished and it's a good use of our time and we did enjoy each other's company. Diana and Minerva are now married and out of the house. Amy is the oldest of the four kids. She is in high school and now she does the grocery shopping with my mom for the family. All the daughters are expected to get our driver's licenses on the day we turn 16, so we will be able to drive mom around when it's our turn to run errands with her, including the very time-consuming grocery shopping. Amy never hesitates to try new things. One afternoon, Amy calls us into the kitchen the four kids are huddled around one corner of the big wooden table. Amy shows us a box. A big red banner that says Duncan Hines is splashed across the box. Okay, mom and I picked this box up at the grocery store. When you open the box, see that mix in the bag? You pour this in the bowl and then add, let's see, two eggs, some oil and water, and that's all. See, like this. Then you mix it all together. Amy is proud to be teaching her younger sisters. Pam, Pris, and I are mesmerized. Sitting wide-eyed and in awe, we listen to her every word and watch her demonstration very closely. Methodically, step by step, our big sister Amy is showing us how to make a cake using a cake mix. What, that's all you do? Yes, but first you have to grease the cake pan with the Costco, shake some flour in the pan, Get it all coated, then shake out the excess flour. Now you can pour the batter in the cake pan and put it in the oven, see? The three of us were so impressed. Wow, cake from a box. I've never heard of that before. I wonder how it will taste when it's done. The cake is finally done and removed from the oven. We bite into our pieces of cake and marvel. The cake looks perfect and tastes really good. Wow, that is so different from making it from scratch. And look, she hardly made a mess. It takes less time from start to finish. Yes, Amy is always the sister who shows us the new things that are out there that our close and insulated Filipino family 
on Yahomi Street is not often aware of. But we will always be grateful for the hard work our parents demonstrate and pass on to us solidly. Even more, we treasure the special sisterhood that is nurtured and cultivated, much like the beautiful roses dad picks to give mom. I'm a member of a small men's group that meets weekly in a blue fiberglass, unheated igloo hut structure set in the middle of a field in Asheville, North Carolina. There are six of us. The facilitator, John Waterhouse, has a PhD in counseling. Johnny G, who's a contractor. Keith Hubbs is a rough hewn metal worker. Frank is a tall guy with blonde hair and glasses, teaches rowing at a college. There's Pete, he's got red hair and a beard, kind eyes, was a tank commander in Vietnam. And me, I was a carpenter too, but I was working as a laborer for a federal contractor. It's sort of a Robert Bly gathering kind of thing. We meet weekly and check in with each other. So John asks, so who'd like to start? I'll go. Okay. So I was born in Albany, New York, um, in a section of town called the South End, a poor section of town, working poor. I went to Catholic school from kindergarten until the end of seven. Laid back, beer drinking kind of guy, um, would frequent the bars every night. My mother was a tall, pale redhead um, with a fierce temper. She felt cold all the time and often would have a sweater wrapped around herself. Now, we were not a religious family. Our Catholic education was about, we were a charity case. Um, my mother was a Lutheran, and I had never seen my father in a church anywhere. So, um, so for me, I liked Catholic school. It was, uh, I really enjoyed the structure of it. I enjoyed the rituals, the ceremonies. And it stood in stark contrast to my um, family environment. Um, I'd like to say that I was educated Catholic, but raised alcoholic. Um, so at home, explosive arguments would happen on an irregular, regular basis. I never knew when the bomb was going to go off. I just knew it was going to go off. It kind of kept me on my toes. So one time when I was nine or 10, I was walking through the kitchen on my way to the backyard, not saying anything to anyone. My mother was in the kitchen. Suddenly she turns around and just sit and unloads on me. What the fuck are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? Jesus fucking Christ, what are you doing? I'm stunned and I look up at her like, and I hadn't been doing anything. And I looked at her and I was calm, I remember. And realizing that my mother wasn't just angry. She was anger, it was who she was. But I'm okay now, it was a tough upbringing. I'm okay now. Um, 
I have to say though that I didn't look then like I do now. I thought I was telling them the whole truth, but there was a big part of me that I wasn't telling. The other guys share and, and share with, you know, with the group. And then John makes an announcement. Next month, we're gonna be having a big gathering of men. Other men's groups will be there, other facilitators. It'll be at a house in Asheville. It'll be a whole weekend thing. Hope you all can make it. Back home. Pretty good. There's going to be a big gathering next month. What's for dinner? Chicken and rice. The next month, I pick up my friend Eric and we head to the big retreat. It's a big, beautiful house with large windows set on the side of a mountain, overlooking a valley with mountains in the distance. Men are gathering, introductions are made, food is consumed, and after that we gather into the large living room next to the kitchen, about 20, about 20 men. How many sits down in kind of a rough circle? Some people are in chairs, some people are sitting on the floor. And I am finding myself to be incredibly uncomfortable in this, in this meeting, in this room. Incredibly uncomfortable, and I don't know why. So people start to share. They're going around the room. And then one guy speaks up and says, well, as a gay man, I feel, and I'm like, that caught my attention, like, not, not by what he said, but how he said it. I'm like, wow, he seems to be really okay with being gay. I'm not okay with being gay. Goes along a little farther, and another man speaks up and says, also as a gay man. And I'm like, the same thing. I don't hear what he says. But how he says it is just, it's just a fact. So I'm actually one of the last ones to share. It finally gets around to me. My, there's like blood rushing. I don't, <laughs> and I don't think it's funny. Um, so then we retire for the night. The next day, after breakfast, we gather in that same room, and the day's activities are being laid out. There'll be some exercises and discussions, and then later on at sunset, a, a sweat lodge. Men start to share again. And one of the facilitators, whose name is Firestarter, jumps up, uh, I'm sorry, John, John starts to share, Johnny G, we call him. And he's talking about the inner critic in his head that is so intense and critical that it prevents him from enjoying life. He's even given his critic a name, Ivan. Firestarter jumps up and says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna split this into two groups. You guys stand over there and you're gonna link arms. You're gonna be Ivan. And you, Johnny, and all these guys are gonna help you push through that line. I'm in the line, I'm, I'm with Johnny. Now Johnny's a pretty well-built dude and he crashes into this line and we're pushing him and pushing him but those guys are really strong too and they hold and they, they push him back. Firestarter says, well, try it again. So now this time we push into the line and I got my hands on Johnny's back and I'm pushing and I'm pushing and I'm pushing like I have never pushed anything in my entire life. And finally, Johnny bursts through and I burst into tears. Later on, Johnny would say, I thought it was all bullshit really, until I turned around and saw Ken crying. Later on, after lunch and stuff, I'm starting to talk with men and having meaningful conversations with men. Men who are curious about my openness to, for, to crying. You see, most men aren't. So 
The next activity up is the sweat lodge. Um, sweat lodge? I mean, is this cultural appropriation? Bunch of white dudes doing a Native American ceremony? I didn't know what appropriation was then. I do now, and I get it. I get the concerns. But then I was unaware of the concerns. Naivete might be excused in this circumstances, but that's not up for me to decide. Are we condemned to be slavish adherents to the culture in which we are born? Or can we choose our own path or a better path that works best for us? See, I've always been a seeker. After Catholic school, I studied religions. I studied all kinds of things. Christianity, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, astrology. I wasn't trying, I didn't know what a sweat lodge was. I wasn't trying to be an Indian. I was just trying, I just knew that my cultural background was not gonna get me to where I needed to go. The walls of my life were crumbling. At sunset, we gather up by the sweat lodge. It's also an igloo-shaped structure. It's got flexible branches. It's covered up in layers of blankets. There's an opening to the east. I can see that there's a pit that has been dug in the middle of the sweat lodge. Outside the sweat lodge is another pit with a roaring fire in it. Earlier in the day, we had been instructed to go find your rock a big rock, and place it in that pit. Now those rocks were being heated. We're all standing around. Some people are naked. Some people are wearing shorts. And then Richard. Earth. We're going to go back into the womb and say our prayers. It's a cleansing ceremony. So now go into the sweat lodge and go in a clockwise fashion. We get on our hands and knees and one by one, we crawl into the sweat lodge and, and, um, and sit down. Richard is the last one in. He's got a bucket and a ladle. Aho Matakawasan. The fire starter outside takes a shovel and takes one of the rocks and it appears in the entrance. Richard takes some sear and sprinkles it on and it flares in the smoke. He places it into the pit in the center of the sweat lodge. One by one, this happens until all the rocks are inside. It's getting pretty hot. Close the door. The flap is closed. Now all I can see is the little faint glow of the rocks. It's pretty dark and it's pretty hot. And Richard dips his ladle into the bucket and pours water over the hot rocks. <laughs> Once. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Three times. Steam fills the little space. Sweat jumps out of my body. It's really hot. It's hard to breathe. And then, one by one, we say our prayers. We've been told that it doesn't matter if you are silent or say a prayer. It's up to you. So one by one, the men start to say their prayers. And I'm thinking about, what am I going to pray? What am I going to pray? What am I doing here? When it comes time, when it's my turn, it just, I just blurted out. I want to be relieved of the shame of who I am and how I am. That's all I say. It moves on. Men pray. It takes a while. It's an ordeal. Then open the door. The flap is opened. Cool air pours in. We crawl out on our hands and knees and stand in the warm North Carolina night. 
not really sure what's happened here. But we drift down to the house with our towels to shower and take the evening meal. The next day, I'm talking with Richard, the water pourer, about the ceremony. Because Oh, I actually have a lot of interactions with animals. Huh, you do? Yeah, I do. And lots of dreams too. I have a lot of dreams about animals. Huh, sounds like you have a lot of guides. I didn't know what he meant by guides. <laughs> I think you should meet this man I know, Will Rocking Bear. Back home, Sometime later, I say to my girlfriend, hey, Devon, I got something I really need to tell you. Yeah? What? Well, I really like to dress in women's clothing. I've been doing it since I was six. Kind of comes and goes. Huh. Well, would you like to dress up with me? What? Really? You want to see me? Sure. I might have some things that will fit you. Okay. How about this weekend? Sure. That weekend, I go into the bathroom. I put on makeup. I put on a bra. I put socks in it, in the bra. I put on a skirt, a top, from some jewelry. And I step out into the living room. Wow, you look nice. Hey, Kenna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to the marsh tonight. And uh, be sure and check out the marsh website and see all the other amazing things that are going on here seven days a week. Uh, come back often. Thank you very much for being here tonight.